I think it's important for people to to understand that if they have insulin resistance, type two diabetes, like the work of mastering diabetes who you just mentioned, but uh, Roy Taylor's work, his clinical work, I know, has had a huge impact on Cyrus and Robbie and and their program, and he's been able to show repeatedly multiple clinical trials, the direct trial, counterbalance, counterpoint, a bunch of them, that you can actually put type 2 diabetes into what they call remission and essentially return to normal blood glucose levels, uh, come off all medications. And it does depend on how long you've had type 2 diabetes and, and as a result, how sort of beat up your pancreas is but what they find is that for many people particularly if they have had type 2 diabetes for less than 10 years um, and very much so if they've had it for less than five years if you lose 10 to 15 percent of body weight you can often enter that um, stage of of what they call remission yeah and this is part of the reason why um, fat loss regardless of dietary choice can be beneficial to diabetes in the sense that when you lose fat you can um, uh, reduce the fat intake content of your liver, reduce the fat content of the fat cells, and re- the, as a result, have lower levels of free fatty acids. But it's actually shocking, Simon, how quickly a dietary modification can result in insulin resistance. So first of all, I, just to reiterate, though, I wholeheartedly agree that diabetes, type 2 diabetes specifically, not type 1, type 2 diabetes is a wildly reversible condition. Um, not to claim that it's easy, but there are dietary strategies that can definitely fix this. So, um, but just to show you how quickly we can put ourselves into a state of insulin resistance, let's go back to the Kevin Hall study. And uh, just to refresh everyone, we're going back to the study where the people went into the metabolic ward and they did two weeks of plant-based and two weeks of animal-based, all right, animal-based keto. And um, if my theory that I'm pr- proposing to you, which is that saturated fat pours gasoline on the fire uh, of lipotoxicity and insulin resistance, and that fiber has the magical healing capabilities of breaking the cycle and restoring insulin sensitivity, if that is true, then why don't we put that to the test? in these populations who are doing a, in the plant-based diet, they're doing a high fiber, low saturated fat diet. And in the keto diet, they're doing a high saturated fat, low fiber diet. Okay, let's put it to the test and see what happens. And I'm gonna, once again, uh, for people who are on YouTube, I'm gonna pull up some graphs here, um, but I'm gonna describe what I'm seeing. So what we're looking at first are free fatty acid levels um, after a meal. So you can see that we're looking at time, 60 minutes, 120 minutes, 180 minutes after a meal. And the, uh, the red line is the keto diet. The green line is the plant-based diet. And basically what we see in this graph, Simon, is that when people are consuming a plant-based diet, their free fatty acids are st- like ridiculously lower relative to the animal-based ketogenic diet. Okay. So we, uh, number my first part of my theory, which is the free fatty acid content, I'm on track so far which is that the high fiber, low saturated fat diet has low free fatty acid levels, while the high saturated fat, low fiber diet has very high free fatty acid levels after a meal. But let's let's finalize this. One of the hallmark tests of insulin resistance is called an oral glucose tolerance test, OGTT. And the way that this works is that if you and I were both doing this, Simon, we would go in and they give us a sugar beverage And we're both consuming 75 grams of simple sugar. And that way, if we're both consuming literally the exact same amount of sugar, we can see how high our our blood sugar goes. And that will tell us uh, whether or not we have insulin resistance, right? When we have a standardized meal and one of us is going to have a spike in sugar and the other one is not. Okay. So, and what we see in this is that, again, these are literally the exact same people, Simon. It's the exact same person. So this is not a genetic issue. Both, like every single person did both the plant-based diet and the high, uh, high fat keto diet. And what we see is that the keto diet has blood sugars that peak, uh, about 30 points higher after consuming the exact same amount of carbohydrate sugar, um, as the plant-based diet. So so they've induced a state of 
relative insulin resistance. I think some if some keto people might push back a little bit and say, yeah, but if you if you change their diet back to a high carb, high fiber diet in a week or so, they'd be back to normal. Yeah, but 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 um, that if you change it back to a high fiber diet they will be normal. And that's that's showing you the flexibility of the body and the metabolism, right? But also it makes an argument, shouldn't we all be consuming high fiber? Why, why would you not? Right. The other point that I want to quickly add is, and, and you, you've, you've spoken directly to this, is the importance of the type of fat. Because often mastering diabetes use a, a sort of low fat across the board diet. But my read on the data on liver fat and on insulin resistance is that polyunsaturated fats have a very different effect to saturated fat. Yeah, and that's why I was quite specific to say that it's just saturated fat or trans fat that where the real concerns exist. Like I, I, I'm not concerned that um, that the use of olive oil is problematic. Now I will say there are people that have what we would describe as, like medically we would describe it as brittle diabetes. And I think this is part of the motivation from Robbie and Cyrus uh, with mastering diabetes is that they both have type one and there's a lot there's a lot of sensitivity there and so as a result of that sort of brittle diabetes where your blood sugar can like sort of go all over the place too high too low and it's just all over the place having that sort of balance in terms of your diet and consistency there i do think that there are benefits to that in the way that they describe it so i understand where they're coming from so you know we in the first part we did energy balance and you challenged me to put it to the test um we talked about the kevin hall study here how do we know that it, in this kevin hall study it's the microbiome and the downstream effect that that has on insulin resistance that is explaining the 700 calorie kilocalories less calorie consumption per day and greater fat loss okay i have the perfect study to demonstrate the way in which the microbiome is central to blood sugar regulation. So, you know, I've been making this argument, talking about mechanisms, lipotoxicity, um, talking about the short chain fatty acid effects, and then showing in the Kevin Hall study, but the Kevin Hall study doesn't have any microbiome data. Let's talk about Li Ping Zhao, uh, who is a professor at Rutgers, and a study where they took a group of people who have type two diabetes, so they have this issue, and they randomized them to one of two diets. The first was a standard diabetic diet that's used in China. The second was a high fiber, high prebiotic diet. Okay, so the, this group of people, they did these two diets. And um, what's interesting is that on the high fiber diet, they noticed a shift in their microbiome. So they were checking their microbiome repeatedly. There was a shift in the microbiome towards the microbes that produce butyrate. So short chain fatty acid. Short chain fatty acid. You did not see that shift take place in the other diet. It was only in the high fiber diet. Then they measured butyrate levels. Butyrate levels in the stool were significantly higher on the high fiber diet compared to the other diet. Okay, so so far we have proof that on the high fiber diet you get you produce more short chain fatty acids next they measured glp1 levels glp1 levels were significantly higher on the high fiber diet next they said well what what effect does this have on these people and they measured after 28 days and discovered that people after 28 days on the high fiber diet had lower hemoglobin A1C. And after they projected this out to 56 and then subsequently to 84 days, so less than three months, there was a statistically significant difference between those two, these two groups. People that were on the high fiber diet had significantly lower hemoglobin A1C. Now there's an important point that I forgot to mention earlier, but actually it's probably best that I just say it right now anyway. These diets were isoenergetic. What that means is they were calorie matched. Same calories. The other issue is that these diets had the exact same level of macros. So the difference, this was not plant-based versus keto. That was different. 
The difference here is really just the fiber intake. And once again, people are getting lower hemoglobin A1Cs on the high fiber diet. They also were losing more weight and they had a reduction in their blood lipids. So this raised the question, Simon, wow, is it the microbiome that is responsible? And, and the evidence that is not necessarily direct, but the evidence that we have is, okay, when you consume a high fiber diet, you get more of the enzymes that produce butyrate. You get more butyrate. As a result of more butyrate, you get more GLP-1. And as a result of perhaps GLP-1 plus these other factors that we've already been discussing, you get lower blood sugar, you lose more weight, you have lower blood lipids, all even though you're eating the same number of calories. Okay. But here's what they did to prove the microbiome part, just to close this out. They took the group of people that ate the high fiber diet and they said, let's, let's actually transplant, do fecal transplants from this group, from before the diet and then after the high fiber diet. And they put them, these two fecal transplants into mice. To different mice. Yes, different mice. So one mouse is receiving the pre-high fiber and the other one is receiving the after high fiber. And what they found is that the mice that received the fecal transplant after fiber had lower uh, fasting blood sugar and had lower postprandial blood sugars when the mice were eating. So in other words, just by shifting the microbiome, once again, they were achieving better blood sugar regulation. Mm -hmm.